Imagine a mother whose son was murdered. Imagine her later in court at the sentencing hearing of the man convicted of that murder, as she is speaking to the judge and to the man about to be sentenced. And imagine her telling the man who killed her son that she forgives him, and then asking the judge for leniency in imposing sentence. Difficult to imagine, you may say? Well, imagine no longer, because Lisa Daniels is that woman. This is Justice Voices, eye-opening stories and commentary about justice, healing, and safer communities. Welcome. I'm David Risley. Our guest today is Lisa Daniels. Lisa, it's good to have you with us. It's good to be here, David. Thank you so much for having me. You have a unique perspective. You're the mother of a son who was murdered, mm -hmm. Darren B. Easterling. Mm -hmm. You are now the executive director of the Darren B. Easterling Center for Restorative Practices. I am. We'd like to talk about that. Sure. And back when we have met, you had been appointed by, again, the previous governor as a member of the Prisoner Review Board, Illinois Prisoner Review Board. Correct. And that gives you a rather unique perspective. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. So we want to hear your perspective, your story, and all these various facets of it. So let's start with talking about Darren Easterling, your son. Okay, let's talk about Darren. Um, Darren is my youngest son. And you mentioned that he was murdered. He was murdered in July of 2012. He was 25 years old when he lost his life. Um, in an in instance of gun violence where I've always maintained that he was both victim and perpetrator. And what that means is simply <laughs> exactly what it sounds like. He was um, in the midst of committing a robbery under the guise of a drug deal that went completely wrong for both parties involved. Uh, Darren lost his life that day, and the young man who uh, was also involved in that uh, incident um, was convicted of murder. Michael Reed. Michael Reed, yeah. And that investigation and case drug out for years. Four years. Four years. Four That's years. a long time. Yeah, it is. Yeah. What was going on in your mind, in your heart, regarding the man who killed your son during that time? I learned of who he was not long after Darren was murdered. Um, but in fact, I think it was before the funeral, so within the week. Um, and I wrote a Facebook post. I can't tell you why, but my heart immediately went out to him and his mother. Um, and I wrote a Facebook page, post about it. And I basically said um, that I've learned of who this gentleman is, and today he's been charged with first-degree murder, and nobody wins. And I would ask all of you that have prayed so fervently for me over the past few days that you now pray for this man and his mother because she lost her son too. Um, and I never deviated from that. And so from that mindset, um, yeah, I never deviated from that mindset from the day that I wrote that post till October 2016 when I sat in the court and gave a victim impact statement um, at Michael's sentencing hearing. I did not blame him for what happened to Darren. 
I was not I was not angry. I saw him the same way I saw Darren as somebody who was troubled and lost in direction, uh, in the direction that they were going to go in in their life. And I felt like he and his mother deserved as much compassion as I did for the loss that I had. You know, that is the golden rule. Yeah, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yeah. We say that kind of glibly. Yes, yes. And yet here's an example of where that must have been a challenge for you, Mm -hmm. even though you were successful in having that heart come Mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. What within you caused you to have that heart? I believe the word of God. I, I just, I believe it. Um, people study it and they read it. Um, they repeat it. But it is the living word, right? It is the living word of God. It is the way that we are to live our lives. And um, there are a few passages on forgiveness. Um, The Lord's Prayer is one of them in itself. He said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then right after the Lord's Prayer, he explains and says, because if you forgive those who trespass against you, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, right. then you will not be forgiven. Yeah, That's pretty straightforward say, yeah. language. Yeah, pretty but, cut and dry. And I'm yeah. sure people who heard that then, yeah. and maybe people who now, they say the Lord's Prayer and mm-hmm. it comes off their lips, they memorize it and exactly. all. Exactly, exactly. But until, I suspect there are plenty of people who are listening right now who are thinking, oh yeah, well, if I were... Lisa Daniels. That would be hard. Yeah, and I don't. I that's something that I've grappled with um, over the years, David, because I don't understand what is hard to understand about that, particularly in the church community. I don't understand what you don't understand about the way I chose to live my life, the way I chose to forgive, because it is a choice. We, we, we have free will. Um, but it just made sense to me. It just made sense to me that that young man and his family deserved an opportunity to continue with their lives and to be better than the young man that showed up to meet my son on July 22nd, 2012. Um, He's still alive, and so he should have an opportunity to be a better person. And um, I have not had any communication with Michael, but I always hope, and I believe that he is... um, making a uh, good use of the second chance that he's been given. Even though you didn't know the details, you knew he had a story. And just knowing he had a story changed your heart. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. He he was, as far as I was concerned at that time, he was no different than my son. And that was just it. He was no different. And what I, what, what I mean by that is... His humanity and his his flaws, his failings. Darren was flawed, and he failed really, really big. And if I could have the capacity to continue to love and to parent and to nurture him, 
in his death that came at his own hand as a result of his own decisions, then why on earth could I not have that same capacity for somebody else? I I just, I always look at the way that I've managed myself uh, in the years since Darren's passing as the way that it just makes sense. It is the way that brings me the most peace. Um, it is the, the, the way through which I am always able to find joy. And I don't understand what anybody else doesn't understand. So whether you use religious language or not, right? I have often said to most people, justice means giving people who have done harm the punishment they deserve. Mm -hmm. Well, what if justice is healing, repairing the damage that was done? Yeah. That it would be unjust to harm even a person who has caused harm in the name of justice. Exactly. How can justice, how can it be just to cause harm right. to someone? Right. You established the Darren B. Easterling Center for Restorative Practices. Yes, I did. And you've mentioned, well, two things. One, I really like that you included his middle initial. That is his name. That's his name. Darren B. Easterling. Yes. Human being. Yes. Whole human being. Whole human being. Yes, he is a whole human being. Not just Darren. Nope. But nope. Darren B. Easterling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That says something to me. Yeah. And then restorative practices. And you said that in the sentencing hearing of uh, Michael Reed, mm -hmm. that you were saying you had come to believe in restorative justice. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say restorative justice? And what do you mean when you're talking about restorative practices? Yeah, yeah. So restorative justice is nothing new. Um, it is a, a lifestyle, um, a, an ideology that has been around for many, many years. Uh, and it is a way of uh, bringing together those who have been harmed with those who have caused harm and allowing the community to uh, work together to repair the harm that has been caused. And as I have, I haven't experienced this, you have, mm -hmm. and you've observed it, mm -hmm. healing happens. Exactly. Would you tell us about that healing part? Yeah. Because I could see, I think a lot of people listening in said, I'll tell you what I'd do if I came, I'd want to throttle the person who right, caused it. Right, okay. right, right. How? So in real talk, let's get yeah. down to no, real, real life. talk, real talk. It, I think it, this it, it's culminated by everything that we've been talking about today. People seeing other people as human beings, the shortest distance between any two people being their a, a story. And when restorative justice, uh, courts or circumstances I, and and I, we don't like to I don't like to say courts because that's kind of counter counterproductive when it's not really a court proceeding but it is a a gathering again the voices of all that have been impacted including the person that has caused harm have an opportunity to speak and to speak their truth and to come together to resolve the problem um, that has been created by the harm that has been caused, whatever that looks like. Um, but the biggest thing, one of the big things that come that 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 happens throughout any restorative proceeding is that human dignity is maintained. Um, the person that has caused harm is not banished from his community and and 
and left to assimilate to in a place that has nothing to do with the community that he came from. Um, that doesn't happen. This person is, is kept in community and is supported by community because the community understands that this person is not the worst thing that he did, he or she did. He is a human being that for whatever reason, based on whatever circumstances, did something that caused harm. And it is more important to keep that person in community in order to enable them uh, or afford them an opportunity to, one, restore, just why, you know, we call it restorative, why it is called restorative justice, to restore community and then also heal from whatever it was that prompted them to cause the harm in the first place. In, I, in listening to you, I could almost say instead of restorative justice, it's more like healing justice. But you're talking about three interests here. Mm-hmm. You're talking about the person who suffered the harm Mm -hmm. or people Mm -hmm. and the person or people who caused the harm Mm -hmm. and the community that they live in. Exactly. Because these are, you know, even if you didn't believe in God, that these are children of God, Mm -hmm. even if you didn't, these are children of our community. Exactly. And the community has been harmed. Exactly. There, it, it, the social fabric has been torn. Exactly. And, exactly. And, and justice would be repairing the tear, exactly. the rift. Exactly. Restoring harmony. Right. And peace. Right. And safety in right. the community. In the community. And you can't punish your way to that healing. Exactly. You got it, David. <laughs> that's, that's it. I've always said, that the way that I see the experience of losing my son should never be the exception. It should always be the rule. Um, And so I continue to share that um, in spaces like this um, and hope that people hear and that their hearts are changed. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Thank you for creating this space, um, enabling individuals to share the beauty in their stories uh, and the wealth from their experiences. Yeah. And the healing in their voices. Thank you. This is Justice Voices. To hear the full conversation with Lisa, go to the Justice Voices podcast, episode 16, either on our website at justicevoices.org, that's dot O-R-G, or on any of the major podcast apps, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and others. And please subscribe to the podcast. And share a link to this excerpt on your social media and in emails to friends. Lisa's story and voice need to be heard as widely as possible, so please help spread her message. And if you are a victim of crime with a story to tell, please share it by going to our Victim Voices page on Facebook or the Victim Voices community in the new social media app of Ible, I-B-B-L-E, and add the hashtag pound sign Victim Voices, all one word, so others can easily find and hear your story and your views. Your story and your voice are important too.